Chapter Five of A Soldier's Letters to Charming Nellie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Asterix. A Soldier's Letters to Charming Nellie by J. B. Polly. Chapter Five Gaines Mill camp near richmond july the twelfth eighteen sixty two crossing the railroad at ashland on the morning of june twenty sixth a large force of skirmishers was sent forward i was one of them and the distinction cost me the hardest day's work i ever did we were formed in line twenty feet apart and admonished to keep the line well dressed to maintain the intervals between us and to keep a sharp lookout for the yankees you can imagine how difficult this was in the wilderness of pine timber and matted undergrowth into which we plunged the most important duty seemed to me to keep watch on my front for the enemy and if i gave my whole mind to that i was certain to get behind or ahead of my comrades or to join forces with the man to my right or left i managed somehow though not to get lost and to be on hand about eleven o'clock a m to assist in driving an outpost of the eighth illinois cavalry from its camp in such haste that it left cooking utensils provisions and forage luckily a halt was called here and we made good use of the time dining at the enemy's expense a cup of well-cooked rice and the best half of a ham fell to me in the distribution of eatables the rice had just been taken from the fire and was too warm to carry in my haversack and as the last thing a confederate soldier can afford to do is to waste provisions i immediately sat down and downed the rice then noticing a party of men sitting on their horses in the road near me i sauntered down to interview them i was on the point of making some impertinent remark inspired by the contempt infantry soldiers feel for cavalry to a particularly seedy sleepy-looking old fellow whose uniform and cap were very dirty and who bestrode a regular rocinante of a horse when an officer all bespangled with lace came up in a gallop and saluting addressed my man as general jackson at first i was disposed to doubt but being convinced by the deference paid him that it was really old stonewall i congratulated myself for not disturbing his meditations as i had intended no one offered to introduce us to each other and as we were both bashful we lost the best chance of our lives to become acquainted that night we camped within hearing distance of musketry and artillery firing on both right and left that on the left being between ewell and the enemy and that on the right away off in the direction of mechanicsville friday morning june twenty seven we again advanced the yankees fell back until they reached a strong almost impregnable position on the ground in the vicinity of gaines mill they occupied a ridge overlooking the chickahominy and between us and that stream their artillery being massed behind three lines of breastworks so constructed along the side of the ridge next to us that firing from one could be done over the heads of the troops in the other all the force of the enemy on our side of the chickahominy was concentrated to check the advance of jackson the confederates began their assaults on this position about noon but were constantly beaten back brigade after brigade had been ordered to charge they had charged and met repulse before whiting's division which consists you know of law's brigade and ours reached the scene of action at four o'clock in the evening said general whiting to general hood pointing to a battery that was doing tremendous execution in the confederate rank that battery ought to be taken general then why has it not been done asked hood because the position is too strong answered whiting my brigade is composed of veterans but they can do nothing with it i have a regiment that will capture it said hood and galloping to the fourth texas dismounted and called it to attention then marching it by the flank to an open field he gave the orders to bring it into line of battle and shouted forward shot and shell began to come thick and fast as surmounting the rise of the hill we arrived in plain view of the yankees and halfway across the field men began to drop wounded or dead from the ranks 
we passed over two regiments said to have been virginians who protected by a depression of the ground were lying down apparently afraid either to advance or retreat at the crest of the hill hood shouted rapidly the orders fix bayonets make ready aim fire charge the timber between us and the enemy hid them from view but we pulled triggers nevertheless and rushed down the hill into and across the branch at the yankees in the first line of breastworks they waited not for the onset but fled like a flock of sheep carrying with them their supports in the second and third lines reaching the road which ran along the summit of the hill beyond the branch and looking to our left we could see large bodies of the enemy in full retreat but they were so far behind us that mistaken for our own troops not a shot was fired at them just across the road from us was an acre lot enclosed by a rail fence in its centre stood a log stable and from behind this an armed yankee peeped out stringfield of company a saw him and mounting the fence in hot haste ran toward the stable determined to capture the fellow lieutenant hughes of company f a mild-mannered gentleman who never really takes the name of the lord in vain but comes perilously near it sometimes sang out go it stringfield go it kill him dod damn him kill him but just as he reached the stable stringfield was confronted by the muzzle of a loaded gun and had it not been for wolf of company f who instantly aimed fired and killed the yankee would have been killed the regiment had more work to do and gallantly did it hood formed the remnant of the command in an old apple orchard while exposed to a terrific fire from the batteries and once more gave the order to charge lieutenant colonel warwick sprang to the front shouting wait general until i get ahead of them and fifty yards farther fell mortally wounded the fourth rushed down into a ravine and up the steep bank to find that instead of one battery there were three so disposed as to attack from the front and on the flank the enemy made no stand at the first but supporting the second were eight companies of the second united states cavalry among them the very company in which hood had served as a lieutenant a squadron of this command charged upon the fourth but more than half of it were killed and wounded and the balance forced to retire in disorder this was the last organized resistance the third battery being easily captured and the enemy driven a mile beyond it then night came on and human slaughter ceased after the fighting i was surprised to learn how little of it i had really seen and participated in it is only the general who stands back in the rear and directs the movements of an army who is able to take note of all that occurs we privates look only to our immediate front right and left and are not permitted to stand on eminences which overlook the whole field of battle therefore you must bear in mind that much of what i relate comes from the lips of others caesar could say veni vidi vici but the privates of his army had to speak in the first person plural and say we came we saw we conquered general hood kept the promise made to us when he was promoted to be brigadier general and commanded the force in its first fight he exposed himself most recklessly but was not harmed the veteran said to me yesterday i tell you what joe i got mighty nervous and shaky while we were forming in the apple orchard to make that last desperate charge on the batteries but when i looked behind me and saw old hood resting on one foot his arm raised above his head his hand grasping the limb of a tree looking as unconcerned as if he were on dress parade i just determined that if he could stand it i would the texans feel very proud for they have been complimented from all sides in general orders the credit of being the first to break the enemy's lines on the twenty seventh has been given to the fourth yet elated as we are by that fact we willingly admit that either the first or fifth texas would have done as well if the same opportunity had been theirs why the troops failed to take the position earlier in the day is very strange to me for 
judging from the speed with which the yankees fled at our approach they would have been equally courteous to any other confederates who made a determined dash upon them the fifth texas captured two whole regiments of yankees the fourth new jersey raised in newark and the eleventh pennsylvania raised in philadelphia whose officers insisted on surrendering their swords in a body to colonel upton and were so prompt in the duty that he was compelled to lay down the frying-pan which he carries in place of a sword and hold the weapons presented in his arms just when the twentieth was being rendered to him he noticed a commotion at the far end of the captured regiments that was near the timber and a squad of the prisoners were making an effort to pass by big john ferris of company b who stood there unaided endeavouring to intercept them springing upon a log the armful of swords dangling about in all directions upton shouted you john ferris what in hell and damnation are you trying to do now i'm trying to keep these damn fellows from escaping returned big john in a stentorian voice let them go you infernal fool shouted back upton we'd a damn sight rather fight em than feed em that was my first real experience of battle charming nelly as you know i have been under fire on the picket and skirmish lines and with my regiment several times but on this occasion there was genuine fighting to be done enemies in plain sight to shoot at and to be shot by i frankly admit that when i first knew we were going in i trembled and my heart seemed to be palpitating away down in the region of my boots i was in the same condition of mind as the tennessean at manassas as his regiment advanced on the enemy a little cotton-tail rabbit ran through the confederate lines and sped away to the rear the tennessee man watched it a moment or two and then exclaimed in accents which betokened heartfelt sincerity run cottontail run if i had no more reputation to maintain than you have i'd run too when i got fairly on the way i felt that it was either fight or run and as soon as the orders to fire and charge were given dragged my heart up from its hiding place to its proper position this done i became a trifle anxious to return the compliments our blue-coated friends showered incessantly upon us and lost all sensation of fear although fully conscious of the danger the most singular sensation i experienced was when my comrades to the right and left began to drop dead or wounded then a strange curiosity assailed me to know how soon a bullet would hit me what part of my body it would strike and how i should feel as i sank to the ground my curiosity was fully gratified a little later something which i thought to be a ball struck me fairly in the centre of the forehead and sent me backward flat on the ground and unconscious in the instant between blow and unconsciousness though i had time to think that it was death i had been kneeling and just behind me crouched lieutenant barziza of company c both of us waiting for the command to go forward when i came to my first act was to feel for the hole i was sure was in my head and barziza's first remark was they would have got you that time polly if your head hadn't been so hard it was only a splinter however from a rail struck by a solid shot but it placed me hors de combat for the balance of that day and will leave a scar that i fear will mar the beauty of my frontispiece i will not distress your gentle heart by an account of the horrors of the battlefield after the fighting was over and it was occupied by the wounded the dying and the dead in time perhaps i will grow accustomed to such scenes or perhaps in the very next battle may become one of the horrors myself who knows but god but understand i do not expect to be killed and am not going to be if i can honourably avoid it too much happiness awaits my return to texas when this cruel war is over that is provided i am not anticipated by the cavalry End of chapter 5